Good morning. Welcome to worship today. It's a beautiful fall day. We've just had wonderful, beautiful weather, and we're so thankful to God for that. And uh, we pray that harvest is going well for everyone. And if not, that it soon will be, right, Larry? <laughs> yeah. Um, Larry and I were comparing notes on our bad week that we had this week, <laughs> but none of, it was, none of it was a matter of life or death. So um, I wanted to make a few announcements. Welcome to any visitors who are here with us today. Uh, on the table at the front doors of the church, there are several things. If you have not yet um, gotten a devotion book for the last quarter, there are some of those. There are newsletters for October, so if you want a printed newsletter, uh, the October newsletters are there. And there are also two baskets full of apples because um, my dad's cousin called me this week and she is 85 and has this apple tree that is just, she can't, she's given away bushels and bushels and bushels of apples. And we went and picked apples and you couldn't even tell we'd picked any. They're beautiful, delicious apples. So please take apples, share them with anyone you know who might enjoy them. Um, she really wants people to enjoy them, so please do. Um, <clears throat> tonight we have another one of our movie nights. So uh, we are showing the movie I Can Only Imagine, which is uh, very good. A uh, very good movie. So uh, I thought today we would see the trailer to give you a taste of what the movie is. So we've got that for you today. It's an amazing song. It just kind of happened. It took about 10 minutes, I guess. Bart, you didn't write this song in 10 minutes. It took a lifetime. How'd you do this? You know, I've never told anybody my story. When I was uh, 11 years old, life was tough. Where's Mama? She's gone. She don't want me no more. And she don't want you neither. And I've always loved music. And I found some songs that I just... I held on to. They gave me hope. Mercy me, that can't be his real voice. Because I needed it. Dad, I can do this. No, you can't. And you're going to blink your eyes, and you're going to realize that life has gotten you nowhere because you chased some stupid dream. I can I'm leaving. Shan, what it will be like. I want you to know that I pray for you all the time. When I want. And I hope that you find whatever it is that you're looking for out there. What are you running from? My dad. Then write about it. Let that pain become your inspiration. I got some stuff I need to sort out. And I deal with it the only way I know how. And that's to write a song. You hungry? I uh, set the table. What is this? I want to make things right. <laughs> you and me. My dad was a monster, and I saw God transform him. You have a gift, real gift. I didn't think that God could do that. And so I wrote this song for my dad. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the song, I Can Only Imagine, but um, it's about what it will be like when we finally get to see Jesus face to face and what will we do, what will we think, what will it be like. Um, and actually, a friend introduced me to that song shortly after my mom passed away, and um, it really meant a lot to me. And it's a, it's a beautiful song, and it's a good movie. So I hope you'll all come and invite a friend or bring a friend or two with you tonight at 7 o'clock in the basement. Anybody have any other announcements? Carla. 
Just say a quick word about Good News Bears. We're having a great season. A week from this coming Wednesday, we will have our final meeting and it will be open to the public. The kids will present Bible verses and uh, the drama readings and their art and crafts. And, and um, so we invite all of you to that. That's at 515 on October 20th. So we hope you can come. Thanks. All right. Um, one final thing. I have three new confirmation students, three seventh, gr seventh graders, and I have no prayer partners for them. And we're, I, I, today somebody asked me, who's my prayer partner? And I had to say, well, you don't have one yet. And it was awful. So please, uh, please, three people, step up after church, talk to me, be a prayer partner for one of these kids, okay? All it is is praying for that child as they go through this time maybe giving them a card occasionally or a note or a candy bar, um, that's it. So please, uh, if you're willing to do that, please speak to me after church today. Okay, if there aren't any other announcements, then we will begin our worship with a time of confession and forgiveness. Please stand as you are able. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, and all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we say that we have no sin, then we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated for our opening hymn, which is I Love to Tell the Story.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Let us pray. Lord God, the Alpha and Omega, you are our beginning and our end. Help us to leave behind any worldly possession or pleasure that would keep us from experiencing the abundant life which you have prepared for all your children. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Our first lesson today is from Amos 5. Seek the Lord and live, or he will break out against the house of Joseph like fire, and it will devour Bethel with no one to quench it. Ah, you that turn justice to wormwood and bring righteousness to the ground. They hate the one who reproves in the gate, and they abhor the one who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and take from them levies of grain, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, you who take a bribe and push aside the needy in the gate, therefore the prudent will keep silent in such a time for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you. Just as you have said, hate evil and love good, and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please read responsively Psalm 90. So teach to us 
to count our days that we may gain a wise heart. Turn, O Lord, how long? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love so that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad as many days as you have afflicted us and as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be manifest to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and prosper for us the work of our hands. O oh, prosper the work of our hands. Our second lesson is from Hebrews 3. Take care, brothers and sisters, that none of you may have an evil, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partners of Christ, if only we hold our first confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as, it, as in the rebellion. Now, who were they who heard and yet were rebellious? Was it not all those who left Egypt under the leadership of Moses? But with whom was he angry 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest if not to those who were disobedient. So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all of these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Well, I wanted to speak to the kids this morning, but also to everybody. So, um, anybody here ever seen a camel in person? Yeah? Okay. So, um, Rick, will you stand up, please? Yeah. <laughs> he didn't know this was coming. Just stand up. I won't make you do anything else. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, stand up tall. Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> 
Rick is about six feet tall, okay? So I looked up how big camels are, and camels are at least six feet tall, maybe six and a half feet. So at least this tall and then huge, like big, right? Like with the humps and everything. Okay, so here I have a needle. Can you even see it? Can you see it? Barely, right? Can anybody see the eye of the needle? Can you see the eye of the needle? It's hard, isn't it? It's really, really, really tiny. I'm going to bring it over. Can you see the eye of the needle? Can you see the little hole? Yeah. Really little, right? Really little. So what Jesus is saying is it would be easier for a six-foot-tall camel with all its humps to get into heaven or to go through the eye of a needle, this little teeny, teeny, teeny hole in this needle that would be easier for the camel to go through the hole in this needle than for a rich person to get into heaven. So, that's pretty crazy, right? In other words, he's saying it's impossible. It's impossible to get into heaven by something we do, whether we're rich or poor or anything else. Nobody's getting a camel through this little hole, right? And nobody's getting into heaven except if they are given that gift by God, right? God is the one who does it, who gives us that free gift, and we're so glad he did. So let's pray about that. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you love each person here today, that you love us, and that because you love us, you want to come into our lives and our hearts and make us your children. Thank you for sending Jesus to be the one who died for our sins in our place and who will take us to heaven to live with you forever one day. We pray in his name. Amen. <clears throat> My sister used to work for the University of Nebraska in the business college, and she worked in the office that administered the MBA program, so with all the business majors. And the college would sometimes host events, and they'd bring in speakers, you know, to address these business students, and every once in a while, the speaker they would bring in would be Warren Buffett. So you probably all know Warren Buffett is the richest man in Nebraska, and one of the wealthiest men in the entire country. And so what do you think would have happened if when Warren Buffett came to speak, my sister had walked up to him and said, Mr. Buffett, I so admire your ability to make money. You are the greatest. What can I do to inherit some of your estate after you die? Obviously, that is not something my sister would have done. But if she had, it's a pretty safe bet that Mr. Buffett would have ignored her or rejected her request and probably been pretty insulted into the bargain. We don't do something in order to receive an inheritance. An inheritance is a gift. Warren Buffett and every other person who owns anything whatsoever is free to give his possessions to whomever he pleases. So, when this man in our gospel reading today approaches Jesus and asks what he can do to inherit eternal life, we should already be hearing alarm bells ringing. The man is asking for the impossible. God grants eternal life to whom he chooses, and no one is good enough to earn that gift. No one. When Jesus responds by saying, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. He is pointing this out. He's really asking the man a couple of very pointed questions. Number one, are you really that good that you think you can do something to earn eternal life? And two, do you realize what you're saying when you call me good? 
Do you really believe that I am God? This man, however, is not going down without a fight. He is confident in his righteousness. After Jesus lists some of the commandments to him, he replies, Teacher, I have kept all of these since my youth. Pretty impressive. I don't know about you, but I can't look at a list of the Ten Commandments and say that I've never broken one of them. I mean, maybe I haven't murdered anyone or robbed a bank, but I certainly have said mean things about other people, sassed my parents, and been envious of the things that other people have. But let's give this guy the benefit of the doubt. After all, the scriptures do mention some people, Job, Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth, and the Apostle Paul, for example, who are said to be blameless before the law. Not sinless, because no one is sinless, but apparently able to keep the external law. So let's say that this guy was like them a really, really good guy who never cheated on his taxes, never cursed when he stubbed his toe on a rock, and never so much as looked at a woman who wasn't his wife. Even so, Jesus doesn't say, wow, you, that's amazing, you're such a great guy, you get a free pass, straight to heaven for you, you've earned it. No. <laughs> Instead, Jesus sees the whole picture. Jesus sees that this man truly does want to be part of God's kingdom, and he sees the one stumbling block that's in his way. For different people, it can be different things. Lust, power, alcohol, popularity. But for this man... It was his wealth, his possessions. They were the idol standing between him and Jesus. And he wasn't alone. In the Jewish culture of the day, wealth was considered to be a blessing from God, but more than that, a sign of God's favor and a recognition from God that you were a good person, a righteous person who deserved all the good things you had. This is probably why the disciples were so shocked when Jesus speaks to them later and says, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of heaven. If they believe that wealth is a sign of God's favor, then they assume that if the rich can't make it, then nobody can. But Jesus, over and over, pokes holes in this false assumption. Blessed are the poor, he says in his Sermon on the Plain, for yours is the kingdom of God. And in Matthew 6, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. And later in that same chapter, he sums it all up by saying, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Jesus knew that the rich man who came to him seeking eternal life might have kept most of the commandments, but he had a real problem with the first and most important one. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. Whether he realized it or not, this man was putting his wealth his money and his prized possessions in the place in his heart that should only belong to God. He worshipped an idol, and that idol was his money. He looks at Jesus, who loves him and who asks him to follow him and be his disciple, and instead of being happy, thankful, or excited, he is grieved Heartsick because he treasures his money and his possessions more than he treasures the one who wants to be his savior. 
You know, this man is the only person in the entire Gospels, all four Gospels, that we know of for sure, walks away from Jesus' call. It's a really sad story. It's also a story that we can find easy to dismiss as not our problem. After all, most of us don't consider ourselves to be rich. Maybe some of us would go so far as to say we're comfortable. But rich? No, that's for people like Warren Buffett and Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates. We're just ordinary folks. We can't be those rich people that Jesus is talking about. Well, maybe we are. After all, it is a fact that even middle-class Americans are richer than 95% of the other people in the world. It is a fact that we can spend four bucks on a beer or six dollars on a fancy coffee with out even thinking about it, while more than a billion people on the world live in less than one dollar per day. And while we don't, and you know, <laughs> we don't just treasure those little green pieces of paper. We treasure all the things they buy for us. Big flat screen TVs, trips and vacations, the latest toys and, grand, and gadgets for the grandkids. Or in my case, dahlia tubers and David Austin roses for my garden. So we do need to remember that it's not about money per se that's the problem. After all, Abraham and David and others who were beloved of God were also wealthy. It's the love of money or the things that money can buy that is a stumbling block to us an idol we can easily grow so comfortable with that we don't even notice that it's the thing we're worshiping. When you get home today, do a little experiment. Take a look at your checkbook or your bank statement or your credit card bill. Take an honest look at how much of your money goes to necessities, how much to luxuries and pleasures, and how much to serving and helping others. And if these priorities are out of whack, pray about it and figure out a way to realign them more closely with what God expects of his people. You don't have to give away all your money. Jesus didn't ask that of this rich man either. But he did ask him to put away the things that were getting in the way of him putting his trust only in Jesus and to share his blessings with the poor. And he does ask the same of us. I talked earlier about how Jesus said it was easier for a camel to go through the eye of a tiny needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. In other words, it's impossible. But it's not only impossible for the rich, it's impossible for all of us. In confirmation class, we've been talking about the basics of the faith. And one of the basics is that every single person, all of us, is sinful in some way or another. All of us have something that gets in the way of our complete devotion to God. If our camel isn't wealth or possessions, then it's going to be something else. Maybe a relationship, maybe an addiction, maybe our need to be liked or respected. Whatever that thing is that gets between us and God, that's our camel. And we're never going to be able to push that camel through the needle on our own. And you know what else? There is one camel that I can guarantee that every single one of us has, all of us, and that camel is ourselves. As sinful human beings, we always, always tend to put ourselves first. And as we also talked about in confirmation, 
Even when we do good things, we often do them for ourselves because we hope for recognition or praise or even because we hope they'll earn us brownie points with God. And if not God, then at least other people. We do this so instinctively that we don't even realize it. Here's an example. And I don't like to share stuff about myself, but, but I just did something this week that is a perfect example. So one morning this week, I decided to take my clippers and my tordon and cut out some young tree saplings that had grown up in the shrubs around the church. And so I was busy doing this, and I heard a car drive by on Main Street. And I caught myself thinking, oh, I wonder if that's somebody from the church. It would be nice if they saw me and knew that I was doing this and going to all this trouble. You see what I mean? I couldn't help it. Instead of just doing something because it needed to be done, because it would make our church look nice and thus glorify God, my sinful self popped up like a groundhog and wanted praise and recognition for what I'd done. And that's just one little example. We are all carrying around a huge camel of ego and pride and a desire to have things go our own way. And no matter how hard we try to hide that camel, or make it smaller, or wish it away, it's not going through that needle. And we can't push it through. But thanks be to God, we don't have to. Jesus gives us the answer to the problem of our camels when he answers the disciples. The disciples ask, who then can be saved? And Jesus tells them, no one. No one can be saved by their own efforts, by their own goodness, by their own keeping of the commandments, by their own power or faith or decision. It's impossible. But wait, there's more. Jesus goes on. With mortals, it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. For God, all things are possible. All things. God can take away your camel, the thing you worship, the thing that's keeping you from him, no matter what it is. That is what God did when he washed you in the waters of baptism and what he does every time you come to him and ask for forgiveness and a fresh start. God can bring you through the needle, and he has. He has chosen you and chosen to give you his kingdom, a place where God reigns and where all of us put him first in our hearts and in our lives. That is the kingdom we pray for, and that is the kingdom that Jesus came to give to you. And you can take that to the bank. Amen. Our hymn is We Give Thee But Thine Own, which is number 686 in the Red Hymnal.
I invite you to stand and join with me in confessing the basics of our Christian faith, what we believe in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated as we give our offerings to the work of the Lord. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have chosen us, that you love us and that you have come down to heaven in the form of your son Jesus to be our savior, to be one of us, to suffer what we suffer and to understand what it's like to be human. And most of all, we thank you that Jesus willingly went to the cross to suffer and die in our place 
so that you forgive us and receive us as your unblemished lambs, your beloved children. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, we're sorry for all the camels in our lives. We're sorry for each and everything that we put in your place that comes between us and you. We pray that whatever it is, you would take it from us, that you would always be first in our lives and in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, we pray in thanksgiving for all the blessings you pour down on us. We thank you for abundant food and clean, fresh water, for our peaceful community, for a good educational system, for our families and neighbors and others who love us and care for us. We thank you that you have blessed us in so many ways, and we pray that you would help us to keep our eyes and ears open to share what we have with those who are in need. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, we pray for all the nations of the world and their leaders. We pray that you would raise up leaders who are wise and just and that peace would reign. We pray especially for those who are suffering in war-torn countries, for refugees, and for all those who are displaced and seeking a home. Lord, in your mercy. Your Heavenly Father, we pray that you would send favorable weather, that harvest would go well, and that all those who are working in the harvest would be kept in safety. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, we lift up families. We pray for parents, that they would be patient and kind and be given all that they need. We pray for children, that they would be obedient and loving. We pray for all those who are lonely because they don't live near family or aren't part of a family or their family has caused brokenness in their lives. We lift them all up knowing that you are the father of all and that in you we all have a family. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Heavenly Father, we remember those who are ill, those who are suffering from any disease. We pray for those with COVID and for those who are undergoing cancer treatments and any other illness or suffering or recovery, Lord. We especially lift up Amy Sue, Mike, Darlene, Sharon, Tana, Carol Jo, Chuck, Shannon, Ken, Roland, Gary, Kyson, Annette, Scott, and all others whom we name before you in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, loving Father, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your abundant mercy. In the name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Our closing hymn is Drawn to the Light, number 593 in the Red Hymnal.
Go in peace, serve the Lord, 